Serial killer Caesar Baroni murdered his first victim when he was just 19 years old. On October 5th, 1976, I investigated a burglary where the victim was Alice Stock. Uh, he threatened her with a knife. Apparently, the investigation of her death, it was very similar to this earlier burglary. I didn't know it at the time that he was doing these murders. Nothing out of the ordinary. Never had a clue that anything odd was going on with him. Caesar's victims were females, and almost exclusively there was a component of a sexual assault in those uh, homicides as well. From what I've learned about him and about the nature of these crimes is that he tended to get his sexual urges and his violent urges all mixed up. I still love him. I can't say I don't love him, even though he did those horrible things. I don't know. It's the weirdest thing. He's my brother. He can't stop loving somebody because they do what they do. In the early 1990s, the police were investigating a spate of murders in and around Washington County, Oregon, unaware they were actually dealing with a serial killer. We had homicides in the early 90s, but his were particularly unique in that they, um, they fit all sorts of different patterns. A nurse midwife shot off the road in the middle of the morning heading home. A woman strangled to death and sexually assaulted in her home. A woman picked up in downtown Portland, a neighboring city, taken out to Washington County and basically executed alongside the road. And a woman that uh, initially was thought to have died of a heart attack that was literally scared to death because Caesar Baroni was trying to sexually assault her. We had no idea initially who the killer was. Most of his murders were stranger to stranger. They're the most difficult to solve, particularly when they're all over the map in terms of the victimology of the victim. Some were strangulation, some were committed with a firearm. A profiler would swear to you that these crimes were not committed by the same person. I remember that jacket. <laughs> it was like a little dude. So cute. And I think this is the next year, because his teeth were all falling out. He's getting his Big teeth in, lose the baby teeth. I remember this shirt too, that's so funny. Caesar is my brother, my youngest brother. There's three of us, I'm the oldest, and then my brother Ricky, two years younger than me, and Jimmy was the baby of the family. He was born Adolph James Rody. My dad's name is Adolph. So that's where Adolf came from. They named him after my dad. And when he changed his name to Caesar, we didn't understand. We always called him Jimmy. So he's always Jimmy to me. Adolf James Rohde was born on December the 4th, 1960. I guess I was about six uh, when he was born. I liked it a lot as he was a little kiddo. Big smile on his face all the time. Jimmy was, he was a little, I want to say a hellion. He would run all over the place. When we were kids, my dad was real active with us. We used to go hunting all the time. We'd go four-wheeling, fishing, camping. We were a big outdoor family. And Jimmy was good. I mean, he was a good kid. I don't know what happened. When Deborah was 10 and Jimmy was four, their parents split up. They would argue, but nothing physical. And my mom took us. We went to Miami. And it was a hard time for all of us because we moved like three or four times. I had to change schools. Jimmy wasn't in school yet. He was just a little guy. My mom got a boyfriend. He was black. And we figured as kids, if my dad finds out about this, he's probably going to be really mad. And my dad used to come and pick us up 
every other weekend when we were with her in Miami. One weekend, my dad told my mom he wasn't coming. So on those weekends, my mom's boyfriend would come over. So he was there, and my dad drove up to the house. There was no hiding it. My dad just said, hey, and go get your stuff. Come on, you're coming with me. He didn't say we were coming with him forever. He didn't say that. He just said, come on, get your stuff. You're coming with me. And we thought it was for the weekend, you know, like always. But it wasn't for the weekend. Well, my dad just didn't want us in that environment of a mixed family. This is in the 60s. And back then, my mom could have tried to fight for us, but it wouldn't have done any good. They would have given us to our dad in a minute because of the interracial relationship she was in, which had nothing to do with nothing, but that's just how things were back then. The odd thing about it all was when my dad did come and get us, my brother was four, but he never once cried for our mom, not ever once. And I thought as the time went by that that was really odd because I figured, why would he not cry for our mom? I cried for her. Ricky cried for her and my brothers. I ended up stepping into a motherly role with them because I felt like I had to. For three children being abruptly removed from their mother's care, typically would cause children to feel some form of distress. They might be um, anxious, more insecure, more worried, what's going on? But for Jimmy, there was no reaction. Now at this point, it's unclear why he wasn't reacting. It could just be that he was very young, but it's very untypical behavior. A few years later, their father remarried, but the children's new stepmother seemed to take an instant dislike to her stepson, Jimmy. I don't know why she treated Jimmy differently other than Jimmy was always laughing and smiling and I think that my stepmother thought he was getting away with things, um, always looking, you know, who did this? You did it, you had to do it. I just blamed him for everything. He lived in a nice neighborhood, nice home. From all indications, his father was uh, supportive of him, um, was active with him. But his behavior began in uh, kindergarten. Um, he got kicked out for throwing food and fighting and so forth at a very young age. It was around this time that Jimmy's behavior at home also started to become an issue. He would get in trouble a lot. Jimmy would steal silly things and, and not so silly things. He stole my high school ring. I know he did. I caught him coming out of my room. He never confessed to that. It seems to be the case from Deborah's story that from very early on, Jimmy was just a compulsive liar. And I think she found herself in an incredibly difficult position because on the one hand, she's trying to um, parent him and love him and be caring towards him. And on the other hand, there's this growing sense of, he's just a liar and how do I deal with that? As Jimmy approached his teenage years, the authorities started to become aware of him. He started into vandalism and breaking into homes at a pretty early age when he was still a juvenile. We went to jail. It was a juvenile place. And he said it was horrible. He wasn't there for that long, I remember. And when he came home, he was the same old Jimmy. Yeah, act like, you know, nothing. Why they put me there, I don't know. He said, I didn't do anything. <laughs> that was what he always said. The first person who noticed that there was something wrong or could be something wrong was my dad. My dad did. And my dad didn't talk to us about it, of course, but I heard him talking to my grandmother about it. And my grandmother was totally opposed, said my dad was wrong. Jimmy didn't need any help. I think what's so interesting about Deborah's recollection of what happened during their childhood is that her father did not ignore Jimmy's behavior. The dad certainly had a view that there was something that his son definitely needed help with. But unfortunately, that was denied. And I think that may have been a seismic error at that point in time to not get Jimmy the support that he might have needed. 
Jimmy's short stint in jail didn't seem to change his behaviour and the atmosphere at home got progressively worse. I believe absolutely uh, my stepmother and my dad splitting up was caused by all of the friction between Jimmy and my stepmother. Absolutely. My dad was just fed up with it. It just ended up where my dad couldn't take it anymore and they split. And my brother still stayed there with my dad. And their relationship was good, but it started to break down really quickly because Jimmy was getting in more and more trouble. When Jimmy was only 15 years old, he committed his first serious crime. On October 5th, 1976, I investigated a burglary where the victim was Alice Stock. She was going into her bedroom and was approached by Jimmy Rohde, who was a neighbor who lived directly across the street. And he was uh, subsequently arrested for burglary and assault. He threatened her with a knife. When he broke into Alice Stock's house, he was hiding behind the bedroom door. He had a knife. He popped out from behind the door when she came home and ordered her to disrobe. And she, in effect, said, I know who you are. You're Jimmy Rohde. And she said, get out of my house. It was pretty clear that he was committing sexual-related offenses even as a young adult, as, as a young man, you know, even as a teenager. I didn't think he would have the fortitude to do that I'd, at the time. I'm like, oh my gosh, it's more, they're blaming him for something that somebody else did. What you're dealing with here is a family who have learned to silence what is happening. If we just squash it down, we won't let anyone else in on what we are trying to deal with. Jimmy does the opposite, he blows it up and he escalates. What he also does with that escalation is he continues to deny, even though there's proof. So now what he's done is exposed his family to who he really is. And I think it's a lot for them to process and I think it's a, it's a kind of complex trauma for individual family members to get their heads around. How is this happening? Why is this happening? And now everybody knows. How do we deal with this? He got sent to the juvenile facility and he was there for just a little while, not very long, and then he came home. We all just kind of tiptoed around it. No one said anything. No one really broached that topic. My dad was cold towards him and we just tried to pick up our life. I wasn't there anymore at that time. Um, he was 15, I was already 20, you know. 21, I already had kids. I was really worried about him. And I talked to my dad and told my dad maybe I should let him come and live with me. But I had a brand new family, little baby. My dad said, that's a terrible idea. My dad said, no, it, you live your life. And we'll deal with this, which him meant him, not me. Because of the fact I always thought I had to be, I had to do it. I'm like his mom even though I'm not. After his release from juvenile detention and now 16 years old, Jimmy Rohde's criminal behavior continued to escalate. He was linked to the burglary of another woman's house in the neighborhood. He began committing other burglaries, breaking into homes. This time, Jimmy was tried as an adult and served two years in the Florida State Penitentiary. He was released in November 1979. He went to prison. He got out, I think it was less than two weeks after he got out when Alice Stock, his neighbor, was found murdered and sexually assaulted in her bedroom. And the Fort Lauderdale police, they were pretty sure he did it, but they felt they couldn't prove it back then. I couldn't believe it. I couldn't believe it. I'd never seen him raise his hand to anybody. He was never physical with any of us. You know, kids, you might slap each other or something, but not really, you know, not physical. Never was a beater or nothing like that. Once again, my brother denied, denied, denied. 
And at that point, my dad started to push him farther and farther away. Not long after, tragedy struck the Rody family when Deborah and Jimmy's brother Ricky was killed in a car accident. My brother Ricky was killed. No warning. Three days after Christmas in 1979. It's the worst day of my life. I was a mess. I was a mess. I couldn't even breathe. I couldn't wake up and open my eyes and do anything. I was a mess. Big mess. Worst mess of my life. I'm sure it was pretty bad for Jimmy, too. But it didn't affect him the same way as it affected me. And I thought, you know, he just handles things differently. Everybody does. But I know it had an effect on him. It was his brother, his only brother. In January 1980, Deborah's father received a call from his former wife, who claimed she'd been attacked by Jimmy. When Jimmy raped my stepmother, I found out about that from my dad. She called my dad right away. And my dad went over there. They had been divorced for some time. I believed her because she had been through so much with us. And she wouldn't have called my dad and told him that if it hadn't happened. She didn't want to go to the police. She didn't want anything to do with that. But she wanted my dad to know. I would speculate that this is somebody who, when he was small, probably had pretty angry feelings towards her and the way that she was treating him. As he got bigger and felt more powerful, and those violent feelings were never far away, rape is not about sex. Rape is about power and control. In April 1980, Deborah got a call to say her grandmother had been attacked. She heard a knock at the door, and she looked out the people and saw my brother Jimmy. The relationship they had together was good. And she said he came in the house and she asked him, what are you doing, Jimmy? What's wrong? What's, what are you doing? And he didn't say anything. And he, I guess, started beating her with a rolling pin. My grandma, by the grace of God, did not die. She survived that. And my grandmother told everyone exactly what happened. The reason they found him innocent was he had not one mark on him, not one mark. My grandma fought for her life. My grandma said I had to left marks on him. She didn't. And my brother ended up getting out uh, because of that. There was a reasonable doubt because he had no marks on him. Although his family now knew what he was capable of, the authorities were only able to convict him for more burglaries. This time he was given a five-year sentence which was increased to seven because of crimes he committed while in prison. His prison history in Florida was pretty rough. He had uh, an escape charge. He'd been on a work crew, and he fled from the work crew, was recaptured. At one time, he attacked a female prison guard. So he ended up in a maximum security section of the Florida State Penitentiary. He was actually housed on two different occasions next to Ted Bundy. Bundy was receiving a weekly newspaper from Seattle, which is where he was from, and he would share it with Baroni. Baroni responded to a singles ad in the Seattle Weekly, and he started writing back and forth to the woman that became his wife. And he convinced her that he was in prison for a small amount of marijuana, and you know how the South is about marijuana. He never told her why he was really there. So shortly after he finally got released, he fled Florida, went to Seattle. She unwittingly helped him change his name. When he changed his name to Caesar, it was really hard for the whole family. Like, what's wrong with him? Why is he changing his name? I thought it was hurtful. My dad just said, whatever. He's beyond my dad at that point. My dad had written him off. He's a liar. He's done all these things. My dad said, no more. So my dad pretty much caught off contact with him, didn't speak to him. 
Deborah, however, continued to have a relationship with her brother, who now seemed to have settled down with the woman he met while in prison. My brother did change after he married, and I thought he changed for the better. He just seemed more responsible. He was just like a normal homeowner. I was talking to him all the time at that point. With Deborah, it feels very much as if selective memory helped her deal with what Jimmy was really about. And I think this is part of the learned behavior of minimizing the bad, because let's face it, from very early on, Deborah had been taught to brush everything under the carpet or push it to one side. Just noticing the good is a relief and, oh, he's all right now. But I think at the back of her mind, there were still probably instinctive fears and worries about what was really going on, but that was probably buried very deep at this point. In terms of his everyday life, he got in the Pacific Northwest in the late 80s. He moved fairly short order up to Seattle. He kind of bounced around from job to job, didn't seem to hold a particular job, then decided to join the Army. He joined the Army under the fictitious name of Caesar Baroni. When he joined the Army, at the time I thought it would make a difference on his character and maybe give him a reason to, you know, have a path, something that he's passionate about, something that he would want to do. And it was a good thing until it wasn't. He was in the Army for probably a year or more when he was identified as an individual that had attempted to sexually touch an elderly woman in the Tacoma area and had been basically trying to groom her with helping her with things, so forth, in her home. Her son was a police officer. She told her son about it, and uh, so an investigation began. The Army discovered that Caesar Veroni was really Jimmy Rohde. They kicked him out of the Army. After relocating to Oregon with his family, Caesar continued to play the loving husband and father. Caesar was very charismatic. He was in good shape. He dressed nice for the community that we were in at the time, and uh, he was a good talker. I mean, he was convincing. He was disarming, if you will. I think his ability to show love and empathy towards his wife was probably an act. He put up this front. He used her. Our family was just a normal family. I still have troubles thinking, how did he get from where we were to where he ended up? And I don't know exactly what went wrong in his mind, but something obviously went wrong. In early 1991, Caesar Baroni was settled in Hillsborough, Oregon, with his wife. His terrifying killing spree was about to begin. Margaret Schmidt lived in a neighborhood close to an elementary school. She'd recently broken her leg, uh, had some other health issues, had to use a walker to get around, and had a caregiver that would come in to help her with her meals and take care of her during the day. When Margaret's caregiver found her in her bedroom, Margaret was nude on the bed. One of her feet was kind of hanging over the edge of the bed. Her nightgown was torn and pushed up around her throat. Margaret had some bleeding on her face, on her nose. Her head had been twisted to the side. When the autopsy was conducted, they found that her cause of death was from asphyxia, from a compression like a pillow over her face, which was there, and some choking also. And later they determined that she had also been sexually assaulted. In the bathroom, the suspect had knocked over a bottle of talcum powder and left shoe prints in the talcum powder. The footprint was about as unique as it could be. You could see the name Reebok on the bottom of the shoe. You got the shoe size. There was a defect in the shoe that was fairly unique. There wasn't a lot at the scene that we could tell about the perpetrator. We knew she lived alone. We hadn't had any other crimes like that in Hillsboro during that time period. So it was new, it was strange to us. It didn't fit any kind of pattern. In the months that followed, Caesar and his wife split up and he embarked on a new relationship. Everything was good. Didn't talk to him all that much because he had his own life now, I had kids. So we're busy all the time. 
you know, he'd call, I'd talk to him, I'd call him. Don't recall having any kind of connection with him that much at those days, because he was busy. In October 1992, Baroni would strike again. Bryant was a nurse midwife who had delivered two babies at Tuality Hospital in Hillsboro the night she was killed. She was on her way home at about 3 a.m. when a car pulled up on the right side of her car. Slightly behind her, the driver began firing a gun into her car. Struck her car several times. One of the bullets entered her uh, right side, came out her left side, resulting in a sucking chest wound. I learned that Martha Bryan had been killed later that morning. I was actually on my way to Bend, Oregon for a vacation, and I drove by her car, which was down there on Cornell Road. It was still at the scene. And she'd been kidnapped out of her car and brought to this location. And that's when he dragged her out of the car and executed her. Her clothes were in such a manner that indicated a, a sexual assault or at least an attempt. But again, here we have a very different murder. We didn't have anything else like this. I mean, this is rare anywhere in the country. Some of the evidence that was collected that night were spent casings caused by a nine millimeter semi-automatic pistol. The bullet removed from her brain at the autopsy indicated that was fired by a 22 caliber. There was blood evidence in her car. A few months later, another body was discovered by the side of Highway 23. Shanti Woodman was 23 years old. She had been at a nightclub in Northwest Portland. She was looking for a ride towards the end of the evening. She was just crumpled up in a pile where she'd collapsed. She died instantly from the gunshot wound under her chin, went up through her brain. It was determined that she'd been sexually assaulted. Semen was located and recovered and saved. And initially that murder didn't match any other murders either. The fact that she'd been sexually assaulted was never released to the public. At that point in time, Margaret Schmidt had been killed earlier in 1991. Martha Bryan had been killed in October of 1992. And now this death occurred after Christmas in 1992 in December. But there was nothing to suggest that Shanti Woodman's death had anything to do with the other two deaths. There was no link between the three. Um, they were all being investigated as separate individual homicides. On the 7th of January, 1993, Caesar Baroni would commit his final murder. One of Betty Williams' sons found her in the bathtub. It was viewed as suspicious. There were concerns about her death based on the fact that she was nude from the waist down, but had a sweater on in the bathtub, the bra laying on the living room floor, the broken jar of coins found outside. There was also a gun found in her apartment. The son didn't know if it was hers or not, but all of those things raised concerns. But the autopsy said heart attack, and uh, that's how it was initially ruled as a natural death. Six weeks later, Baroni targeted another elderly woman, this time in the town of Cornelius. He shows up at her house one day. His car broke down, something like that, and needed to use her phone. She let him in, and then uh, he began to threaten her with a knife, ordered her to disrobe. He was clearly gonna uh, assault her. She convinced him that she had some family members that were gonna arrive soon, and that he needed to leave. And she told him he could come back later. He fell for it and left. Fortunately, he didn't get the chance to come back later. He was arrested for that crime, for attempted rape, menacing, and a few other things. That's how he ended up in jail. 
Baroni's killing spree was brought to an abrupt end, and while he was in prison, the family of his former wife contacted the police as they believed Caesar had been committing fraud. They found out that someone had been stealing money at ATM machines. The family immediately suspected Caesar Baroni. That's when we first heard that Caesar Baroni was an uh, alias and that his real name was Jimmy Rohde and that he was uh, from Fort Lauderdale, Florida. Got a hold of a very sharp detective in Fort Lauderdale, told them all about the murder of Alice Stock and Baroni's history in Florida. And they sent us the report. Right away, we see a lot of similarities between Alice Stock's murder and Margaret Schmidt's murder. Um, and things just began to s snowball at that time. He became a person of interest in multiple cases in multiple jurisdictions involving homicides and sexual assaults. And a task force was created specifically to work on that and follow up on that. We linked the murders in part through a search warrant that we served at his house. One of the things we recovered was a Browning high power nine millimeter pistol. Short time later, the firearms expert from the crime lab calls and says, this gun that you seized out of Brony's house, that gun and no other gun in the world fired those bullets into Martha Bryant's car. Also recovered from the house were the Reebok trainers that matched the shoe print left in talcum powder at Margaret Schmidt's house. In detention, Baroni was also proving useful to detectives. I think the real start of Baroni's downfall was when he began to brag in detail to two inmates in the Washington County Jail. He would take combs, bars of soap, and place them on the floor and demonstrate where Martha Bryant's car was and where his car was in relation to her car when he began to shoot at her car. He was disclosing details that we had never released to the media. For instance, the fact that Woodman had been sexually assaulted. The task force also discovered that the weapon used to murder Shanti Woodman was a match for the gun found in Betty Williams' apartment, who until this point had been thought to have died of natural causes. Betty Williams' cause of death was a heart attack. They determined that at the autopsy, um, but there was a lot of speculation that Caesar was in the process of trying to sexually assault her, and that may have been what led to her heart attack. Now that Caesar was in prison, he decided to call the only family member still talking to him. The first time I found out he was a suspect in any kind of murders there, was from him. He told me, this is starting again. You're looking at me like I'm doing something wrong. I haven't done anything wrong. Well, if you haven't done anything wrong, so then what do you got to worry about? That's what was my response to him. He didn't tell me anything, and there was nothing in his behavior that would make me think he was doing anything other than normal, normal Jimmy stuff. No, nothing, nothing. And he didn't act funny, he didn't act weird or different or anything. It's the same old Jimmy. In 1994, Caesar Baroni was charged with the murders of Margaret Schmidt, Martha Bryant, Shanti Woodman, and Betty Williams. When he was going to trial and that whole long ordeal, the detectives and his lawyers came to see not only me, I know they went to see my dad too. And they were the ones that told us these are facts and they showed us the proof because we couldn't get any of that from Jimmy. He would not, he didn't do it. It was just a hurtful time, really hurtful. And I just felt like I had to do what I had to do because I can't say I don't love him anymore. And I can't say I want to turn my back on him. In November 1995, Caesar Baroni was found guilty of all four murders, much to his family's horror. I met Debbie. Bob Herman and I went to Florida to prepare for the penalty phase. And uh, we met her there and interviewed her, interviewed other family members. She was in denial, which makes perfect sense. She didn't want to admit that her brother was responsible for all this. 
mayhem and pain and suffering and tragedy. I kept a relationship with him because I felt like he would be abandoned. And it was bad enough that we had to, um, that we were taken from our mom early. And I couldn't understand how my dad just pushed him aside and said, I don't want him in my life anymore. He's your son. He's my brother. And I felt like if I didn't do that, he would be all alone. And I didn't want him to be all alone. Even though my family was not real thrilled, my dad was pretty upset because he saw how it was affecting me. And so it was at that time that they told me I need to go get some counseling to help me work through all that. Because it was very confusing for me too. I don't know why I wanted to keep that going with him and I don't, I don't, couldn't understand why I couldn't get away from that mothery feeling. Like I just felt he was alone and I couldn't leave him like that. For Deborah, hearing from Jimmy that he'd been arrested for multiple murders and finally understanding that, you know, he was guilty of them, this earth-shattering moment would have pierced her imagined fantasy of who he was because I think she had formulated a reality around him that she could cope with. It would be incredible trauma for her to start to process. He is a serial killer, she has to confront that, and it's the stone cold truth that is going to blow apart Deborah's reality. In 1995, the jury heard information from several different cases and their determination based on everything that they heard during the trial and during the sentencing phase brought them to the conclusion that he deserved the death penalty. I remember going there and going up in the front of the whole courtroom and asking them to please don't kill him. I just thought if we could figure out why, maybe somebody else would get a benefit of that with the knowledge that we would learn. From what I've learned about him and about the nature of these crimes is that he tended to get his uh, sexual urges and his violent urges all mixed up. I have mixed feelings about the death penalty, but I think it was perfectly appropriate for him. He was just so dangerous. I think there are certain cases where it's a matter of protection of society, Deborah continued to stay in contact with her brother, even while he was on death row. Hey, sis. This is dated January 18th, 2009. Just wanted to drop you a few lines to let you know that I was thinking of you and to say, hey, how are you doing? How is everyone else? Good, I hope. Tell them all I send my best and all my love. I hope everything is going well. Take care for me and stay safe. I'll write more soon. I love you, Caesar. To this day, Deborah still struggles to understand why her brother did what he did. I was thinking he had a bad thing about my mom because of her not being there when we were little. And maybe that caused him to have some worse feeling to older women, like Alice Stock or my grandma. I think from Deborah's point of view, she's looking for reasons why. Of course she is. That would be anybody's, you know, uh, approach to this. This is your sibling who has murdered multiple women. So for her to go back and, and trace it to that point where, you know, maybe being taken away from mum has caused all these events, could be. We don't know. She's still trying to find out for herself why this happened. I don't know that she'll ever get closure on that because what he did was so incredibly heinous and devastating. The police in Florida did indict Baroni for the 1979 murder of his neighbor, Alice Stock, 
but because he was now on death row, the charges were dropped. Years later, DNA was found on her nightgown, which was tagged to Caesar Baroni. There's no doubt he was the killer of Alice Stock. And there were a number of other homicides that Caesar Baroni was linked to that there was insufficient evidence to proceed further and prosecute him on. And then another thing you have to remember is once he was arrested, all these bizarre murders in Washington County, Hillsborough, stopped. It had been relayed to us that he had cancer and that he was nearing the end of his life. And so we thought that we would take the opportunity to try to interview him one last time. I told him, I said, you could put some people at ease. There are family members out there wondering what happened, how it happened. And, you know, if you could answer some of those questions, that would, you know, you'd be doing something good in the last days of your life, but he would not hear of it. He could care less. A few days before Christmas in 2009, Deborah would have a final conversation with her brother. I talked to him for just a few minutes, maybe 10, 15 minutes, and then I got word. You said he wasn't feeling so good. He said, I haven't been feeling good. Um, and then I got the word just a few days later that he had passed in the infirmary there. So I was thankful that he died that way instead of being killed, which I understand from the victims that would be the preferable way. I do. And I feel bad for feeling that way myself because in respect for them, as I do feel horrible for those families. I feel horrible. And I wish my brother hadn't done those things. There's so many lives that would be different today.